Okay, here we go. I'm going to take a drink of water. Mm. This is such a beautiful space, isn't it? Yes. Have you had an opportunity to kind of just bathe in the beauty of it, the colors, the sconces? <laughs> I love the sconces. And I and I asked I asked Austin and Bobby. I said, "Where where did you find those?" And they said, they, "Their answer was very disappointing." They said, "Like, oh, at a Home Depot." <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Wow, the New Jersey Home Depot. I, I like <laughs> pretty elegant stuff there." So I'd like to. Uh, start with just listening to a couple of excerpts from a talk that my dear friend Ingrid Newkirk gave um, at the Jirmukti Yoga School some years ago. And I'm so glad that I recorded it because it was about 18 years ago and um, I have these precious words um, to listen to now. Ingrid Newkirk, I hope you all know, is the founder and president of PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And she's a very wise and compassionate and passionate person and um, very eloquent. So I think these excerpts that I've chosen to share with you will help us this evening in kind of put it all together for simple recipes for joy. So I want you to feel free to be comfortable. Uh, you can lie down if you like, um, or sit as you like, or sit in Virasana. But for the beginning of the class, we'll be doing a lot of listening to me talking and to other people talking. All right, so we kind of set the Set the mood with some teachings. The worst thing that happens to animals, and there are so many, there's a wealth of worst things perhaps, is what Peter Singer said about animals, is that most human beings come into contact with them three times a day when they eat them. It's a terrible way to define a relationship. I go out and I talk to groups of hunters and wildlife management. I have to put the inverted commas, forgive me, I just can't do that in commas. Wildlife management groups. And they always say, you know, well, we kill the animals because we love them. We love to be out in the outdoors and we just love them. And, you know, you, you don't understand being from the city. And I think, well, I'm glad I understand then, because that's not how you define a relationship. You don't show that you love by killing. You show that you love by nurturing, by saving, by reaching out, by opening your heart, by opening your mind, and by whistling away at all the prejudices that we grow up with. We can't help it. We come with this baggage of prejudices, and then Little by little, one by one, if we're lucky, and if those we're prejudiced against are lucky, we manage to scrape away some of that prejudice and see what we're dealing with and what we're doing and what our options are. So Ingrid is talking about um, prejudices. Patanjali in the Yoga Sutra also talks about prejudices. And he actually says that the biggest obstacle to yoga, which is the realization of who you really are, your true identity as connected to God, and we can also call in yoga enlightenment, we mean the same thing. Patanjali says that the biggest obstacle to yoga 
to this enlightenment that we seek, to this experience of our true nature as Satchit Ananda, truth, consciousness, and bliss, mostly bliss, that the biggest obstacle, the biggest obstacle is our prejudices. So any yoga practice that we invest in, that we engage in, that we immerse ourselves in, should help us, for goodness sake, help us to let go of these prejudices, to free our hearts and our minds from these prejudices that we have carried around with us for years and maybe lifetimes. Prejudices which tell us that other beings, other animal beings, are not worthy of the same rights and considerations that we ourselves value so dearly. Happiness and freedom. So these practices of yoga should help us to whittle away those prejudices so that we're not encumbered by them, so that we're not enslaved by our own prejudices, so that we can be free to realize our true nature as Satchitananda, so that we can be free to experience eternal joy, boundless, limitless happiness. That is what our purpose is. As George Harrison said in his beautiful song, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, there's a line in that song where he says, sadness is not what you are here for. Sadness is not what you are here for. Joy is our purpose. I'd like to um, ask my beloved April, who's helped me so much uh, with pulling this book together, Simple Recipes for Joy. She helped bake a lot of cakes and cookies and stuff like that. And, um, and she's also, she has many talents, and uh, one of her many talents is uh, with Sanskrit. So since she's here in the room, She's a much better Sanskritist than I am. And uh, I'd like to ask her to lead us in this marvelous, fabulous, incredible sutra from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. And so we can, we can learn it and sing it along with April G. Hanam Hanam Esham Esham Kleshavad Kleshavad Uktam Uktam Hanam Esham Hanam Esham Kleshavaruktam, Kleshavaruktam, Hanam Esham, Kleshavaruktam, Hanam Esham, Kleshavaruktam, Hanam Esham, Kleshavaruktam. Hanam Esham Kleshavaruktam T 
together. Hanamesham Kleshabaruktam Hanamesham Kleshabaruktam Hanamesham Kleshabaruktam The greatest obstacle to the practice is one's own prejudices, is one's own prejudices, based on one's own preferences, based on one's own preferences. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. So as Ingrid said in the in the recording. We have all these prejudices, and and we somehow we just can't help it. We're raised with these prejudices. We're conditioned by our culture. But the good news is, cruelty and exploitation and meat eating and enslaving animals and stealing from them is not hardwired in us as human beings. It's something we learn. And that's why it's good news. Because something that we learn can be unlearned. There's hope. I'd like to play another excerpt. It wasn't that long ago that major newspapers in this country wrote editorials fearlessly saying if we give women the right to vote, we'll have to give asses the right to vote. And they meant it, and they felt comfortable saying it. And they wrote editorials saying, well, there'll never be a woman doctor because they'll just all faint at the sight of blood and they'll disrupt the operating room. And physicians operated on poor Irish immigrant women who came to this country. They perfected their gynecological surgeries on them so they could sell those surgeries once they were refined to rich clients. It wasn't so long ago that we sold people in this country. We sold them and we didn't believe. Our people before us didn't believe that blacks could experience maternal love that was just ridiculed. There was no problem with selling a daughter away from her mother because everyone knew that a black woman couldn't experience maternal love. These were lazy and degenerate people. They had no worth. They were subhuman. The same is true in World War II. Look at what was said of Jews. Look at all the discrimination that has existed not so long ago, even now. And we look back on our history and we say, oh, well, that, obviously, that's absolutely, we condemn it. It's disgusting. No one could believe it happens. We're shamed. But the challenge is not that. It's like the challenge is not to look after your own child. That's easy. You love that baby. The challenge is not to look back and say, yes, that was wrong. The challenge is to look around us now and say, what are today's concentration camps? What are today's prejudices? How am I discriminating unfairly and behaving badly today? And that's the challenge for all of us.
Should we take the challenge together? Yeah? Great. Om. Om. Loka Samasta Sukino Mavantu Loka Samasta Sukino Mavantu May all beings everywhere be happy and free and may the thoughts words and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all shanti shanti Shanti. Lift up your arms, make me an instrument for thy will, not mine but thine be done. Free me from anger, jealousy and fear. Fill my heart with joy and compassion. Shanti, 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 Hari. That's the, the vegan pledge, what we just did. We made a promise to everybody. We had witnesses, everybody in this room, to the universe, to all planets and solar systems. We just said that together. We said, may my own life contribute to happiness and freedom for others. May I be freed of anger, jealousy, and fear. May I exude happiness and joy and compassion. Wow. That's yoga. That's yoga. That's the practice of yoga. Wanting that, desiring that, cultivating that, being really attached to that. Mm. Having a burning desire for that. Having a burning desire to enhance the lives of others. That's the way of the yogi. So yogi is not so interested in themselves. What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? A yogi is smarter than that. A yogi realizes that the key to one's own happiness is to do all they can to enhance the lives of others all they can to bring a condition of happiness into the lives of others. Not to support 
or condone or be a part of slavery for others in any form. Not to condone or support or be a part of causing unhappiness in the lives of anyone. Because the yogi knows whatever we do to others will be done to us. Eventually, but inevitably. That's also good news. That shouldn't make us feel like um, like we're uh, like we have something bad to look forward to, like retribution or something like that. It's like that's good news because what it implies is we can have any reality we want. But we must plant the seeds for that reality. So whatever situation in life you want to find yourself in, make that situation happen for others right now. Like plant those seeds. And seeds, if they're nourished, will sprout and bear fruit. In fact, everyone is experiencing whatever they're experiencing, their present situation. Your present situation that you're experiencing in your life, where did that come from? It came from the seeds that you planted before. That's how it is for everybody. So if you want to change your life, you can do it. You got to plant the kind of seeds that you want to see sprout and bear fruit. How we treat others will determine how others treat us. How others treat us will determine how we see ourselves. How we see ourselves will determine who we are. So as yoga practitioners, we want to see ourselves as yogis. What's a yogi? An enlightened being. Who knows their true nature? As Satchit Ananda. An enlightened being is a happy being. An enlightened being does not see themselves as a victim of any other being or of any circumstance. In fact, a victim and an enlightened being, never the twain shall meet. They cancel each other out. So we have a choice. We can choose enlightenment or we can choose to see ourselves as victims. It takes a lot of courage and boldness to let go of the victim stuff. But it can be done. It can be done. It certainly can be done. But in order to have the enthusiasm to do it, you have to have faith. You have to have faith in the goodness of your eternal soul. And coming together with other people who also want to cultivate that faith in the goodness of their eternal soul will help you to cultivate that kind of faith in the goodness of your eternal soul. The nature of your eternal soul, your 
Atman is Satchit Ananda. Truth, consciousness, and as Shamdas would say, mostly bliss. You know, a lot of the ancient yogic scriptures, they have um, a warning at the beginning, like the first page. And it says something like, if you don't believe that enlightenment is possible for you, read no further. <laughs> These teachings are not for you. Yeah. So you have to at least give yourself some space. Try to cultivate the idea that you have the capacity or you have the potential for enlightenment, for self-realization, for happiness. Like give yourself that space. And whenever you find yourself falling into trying to paint the picture that you're a victim, try to remember it. Try to remember what you're doing and immediately say, let go, or Shri Krishna Sharana Mama, or something that will help you to get back on track. You know? You know what I'm talking about. Like you're having tea with your friend, and they say, how are you? And you start running it down. <laughs> like, how your boss was unfair to you today, or how you were trying so hard um, to do your job, and nobody noticed, and that's victim stuff. It might be true on a relative level, yeah. But on the ultimate level of reality, on your soul level, it has nothing to do with truth. The truth is truth, consciousness, and bliss. So that's your touchstone. That's your touchstone. And the asana practice can certainly help us cultivate these types of seeds for our own realization. Patanjali says about asana, stira, sukham, asanam, stira, sukham, asanam, The connection to the earth, to all beings and things, should be mutually beneficial. It should consistently come from a place of joy. If that is you desire yoga, happiness, bliss, and ecstasy, wow, what a concept. Asana. Asana, we get an English word, as, from asana. <laughs> and it means just that, it means a seat. What does a seat mean? Seat is a relationship, a connection. To what? To the earth. To the earth. What's earth? What constitutes the earth? Earthlings. Right? Others. Other beings. Yes? What's realized by the yogi in the yogic enlightened state? Oneness. 
the oneness of being. So, to get there, we got to get rid of all these others. And then there'll be one. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you get rid of otherness? Love. Love is the only thing that can dissolve otherness. True love. True love. Unconditional love. God is love. God can dissolve otherness. So there is oneness left. So, asana practice is so incredibly efficient to awaken this love, to awaken this magic elixir that can dissolve otherness, that can free us from all of the issues that we have with others, psychological issues, the emotional issues, all of the issues that we have with all the others in our lives. Wouldn't you want to be free of all that, of the negative issues? Everyone would want that. Because everyone wants to love and be loved. That is the innermost heart's desire of every being, not just human beings, all beings. Because love is the nature of being. It is the true ground of being. Not fear, not anger, not sadness, not disappointment, not shyness. Love is the true nature, the core. We're talking about core yoga. <laughs> yeah, we should all be practicing core yoga. Yeah. The essence, get at the root, get at the good stuff, has love. Love is that core. Love is that core. So the asanas are so efficient and so incredibly practical at allowing us to experience love, to awaken love. Before love can really be awakened, there has to be respect first. And through respect, compassion will arise. And through compassion, devotion. And through devotion, love. Respect, <laughs> compassion, devotion, love. Four, really strong four legs to this beautiful structure. Very, very wonderful geometry. When we practice standing asanas, We are activating, we, give, we are getting access to, we're activating the doorway into the muladhara chakra, the root chakra. And chakras are doorways to perception. Perception of what? Self and others. So there are karmic relationships that we all have with ourselves and others. And the practice of yoga asana, don't let anyone tell you that asana is the physical practice and then meditation, chanting, praying, these are the spiritual 
more elevated practices. It ain't necessarily so. Just like any yoga practice, asana practice is whatever you want it to be. It can be a practice that will bring you to enlightenment. But you have to want that really badly to transform the asana practice into a bona fide spiritual practice that will bring you to enlightenment. But it can bring you whatever you want. It can make you more flexible, more healthy, more calm, more strong. You can have that. Why limit yourself, though? I mean, most, most normal people, and let's face it, you're not normal. <laughs> That's okay, we're all here together. We got our <laughs> abnormal club. We find solace in our abnormal club. <laughs> Most normal people really feel small. They feel they don't really see themselves as having much potential. Right? They don't really explore the full capacity that we have. And this life is so short, it'll be over before you know it, no matter how many years you live in this present body. But to use this life to awaken to the goodness of your eternal soul, to use this life to realize love, to realize God, that's not a wasted life. But it takes, in order to do that, you have to embrace a fuller capacity for being than a normal person would. You have to have high ambitions. Be very ambitious. Very ambitious for the good things, the eternal things. Don't waste your time in being ambitious for the things that come and go, that won't last. Go for the eternal stuff. The Satchit Ananda kind of stuff. So, Muladhara Chakra, the karmic relationships that are held in that chakra, in that level of perception of reality, Parents, money, home, job, all the people involved, like landlord, roommates, bosses, employees, the earth, the ecology, the environment. Didn't you ever wonder why in pretty much every yoga class that's practiced, in the world today, there's such an emphasis on standing asanas. It's because we have so many issues with our parents, with money, with home, with the earth, with the environment. Yeah. Swanistana chakra, second chakra. The karmic relationships that are accessed there are relationships with others who we have had romantic partnerships with, sexual experiences with, um, creative partnerships like business partnerships or artistic partnerships, or children, or unborn children, aborted children. We still have a relationship. The asanas that will help us on a practical level 
to resolve those relationship issues. Standing asanas are muladhara, swanisthana, forward bending, hip opening asanas. And then we practice twisting, and then we access the Manipura chakra and the karmic relationships there are relationships that we have with those others that we have hurt. We only hurt others because we think we're going to get something of benefit for ourselves out of it. And that's the underlying reason why people eat meat or dairy products. They know that it's hurtful to the other animals, but they feel that they have to do it because it's going to benefit them. It's better for their health or whatever reason they have been conditioned to believe. Yeah. The Anahata Chakra, the heart center, the asanas that are associated there are backbending asanas. And the relationships are with others who we feel have hurt us. And we hold on to it. We feel victimized by it. Vishuddha chakra in the throat. The relationships that we're dealing with here are the relationship that we have with ourselves, how we see ourselves. The asana that help to access and to purify that chakra and that perception of ourselves is Salamba Sarvangasana. And the whole series that usually goes with it, Halasana, Karnapidasana, Matsyasana. And then, Ajna, Ajna Chakra, the third eye center. The relationship there is with our teachers. All the teachers we have had. We must resolve those relationships so that they resolve into love. There's no negative issues lingering. How do we do that? Bekiyasana, child's seat. Put our head on the ground. Stimulate that chakra. And then shirsasana, standing on your head. You access the sarishwara chakra, the crown, thousand-petaled lotus. The relationship there is with God. So, others in our life, our relationship with others is very important. Others are not in our way to our happiness, to our enlightenment, to yoga. Actually, they are providing us with the way. If we can do all we can to enhance their lives, to contribute to their happiness and their liberation, then our own happiness and liberation will be ensured. It's really so incredibly simple and also so incredibly complicated. But the complication seems to be in our lack of faith that the yoga will actually work. But that's why coming together like this is an opportunity to cultivate faith. Because we have a lot of work to do. We have a great destiny. Each one of us in this room has a great destiny. And we need the support 
and the help of others to fulfill that destiny. And that destiny is to be an enlightened being this lifetime. Simple recipes for joy. That's why we're here, to, to get that book, to talk about that book, to ask questions about that book, whatever, to eat the food from that book. Simple Recipes for Joy is the title, and it has a double meaning. Simple Recipes for Joy, simple as in easy, quick, not too complicated. Um, I got a beautiful email and a picture from a 12-year-old boy recently who lives in Geneva, Switzerland. And he told me that his two favorite recipes in the book were the chocolate cake and the chocolate mousse. <laughs> and so, he's a 12-year-old boy, and so he said, he made both of the recipes, and he put them together. <laughs> like, instead of icing the cake with the icing recipe, he used the chocolate mousse. <laughs> and so he sent me this beautiful picture, and the chocolate mousse is um, this thick, and the cake is the same thickness. <laughs> and he calls it the Nirvana chocolate cake. So, if a 12-year-old boy uh, whose English is not his first language can use the cookbook and, and make this, it's simple. The recipes are simple. Uh, the other meaning behind Simple Recipes for Joy is that it's a vegan cookbook. And that veganism is the most simple, as in direct, direct way to increase more joy in your own life, in the lives of others, certainly in the lives of other animals, and in the planet, for the planet, the environment of the planet. Raising animals for food only contributes to more sadness in the world. You know, they call it the standard American diet, the meat and dairy diet, and standard American diet uh, is abbreviated SAD. <laughs> and it is sad. It is sad. And it does perpetuate sadness. It doesn't perpetuate more joy or happiness. Um, meat and dairy is the uh, um, cause of most of the major diseases that are plaguing human beings at this time. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity. And, um, and certainly, it doesn't contribute to more joy for the other animals. It cont contributes to their sadness. Slavery. Slavery is not a happy thing for the slaves. I don't know about you, but I'm an abolitionist. Slavery is, has never, it's, it's experiencing a heyday on planet Earth at this time, 2014. There's never been more slaves on planet Earth than there are right now. So, as a vegan, you don't contribute to slavery. You don't support it, you're not a part of it, you just, you... As a vegan, you're actually involved in the dismantling of the slave culture. I think that's a good thing. I mean, certainly for those of us who are yoga practitioners, moksha, mukti, this means liberation. 
Whatever you want, you can have in life, Patanjali says, if you provide it for someone else. So if you want mukti, moksha, then by depriving others of their freedom, you're not planting the right types of seeds for your project, for the garden you want to grow. So the sad diet is very sad for the animals. The sad diet is very sad for the planet Earth. It is the leading cause of the environmental devastation of this planet. Deforestation, water pollution, global warming, fossil fuel. You know, all the fossil, most of the fossil fuel is used to raise animals for food. So, my goodness, it's simple. Simple recipe for joy, veganism. Shanti, 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 Hari. proud go vegan thank you all for your precious attention please come onto your hands and knees and press back to Adamuka Shwana